From Austin, Texas, it's The Cube, covering OpenStack Summit 2016. Brought to you by the OpenStack Foundation and headline sponsors, Red Hat and Cisco. Now here are your hosts, Stu Miniman and Brian Gracely. Welcome back to theCUBE, SiliconANGLE Media's flagship program. Go out to the show, help extract the signal from the noise. This is OpenStack Summit 2016. Really happy to have on the program, first time guest, Rich Haig, who's the Global Head of Reliability and Operations with Patty Power, Betfair, and a super user here, and a, you know, first time attendee at the OpenStack show. Rich, thank you so much for joining us. And no problem, it's great to be here. All right, so Rich, uh, Global Head of Reliability and Operations. Tell us a little bit about you know, what's your job, uh, Patty Power, Betfair, you know, what, what do they do? Sure, so uh, the, it's the longest job title in the world, I think. It's vaguely looking after two areas. So I have a site reliability engineering team, and they're really looking at maintaining the site, keeping it available. Um, and I have the operation side, which is everything above the hardware that runs all of our Linux production estate. So between those two teams, we, we keep the lights on, we keep the site going, but we also look at getting software from our developers through to production as quickly as we can. All right, and, and the company? So Paddy Power Betfair is just merged from Paddy Power and Betfair quite recently. Um, so if I talk about Betfair occasionally, I mean Paddy Power Betfair, apologies in advance. Um, the the company's the, one of the world's largest online gaming companies, gambling companies, um, and it's been, it's about 15 years for Betfair, um, a little bit longer for Paddy Power, um, but very technically led across both brands. All right, so yeah, to totally understand, uh, you know, if the site's down, uh, you guys aren't making money. So, For sure, uh, yeah. Uh, talk a little bit about, you know, what led you to OpenStack then, uh, you know, uh, how that fits into kind of, you know, you've, you've obviously got websites, but, you know, where, what do you think of, what is cloud to you versus yep. websites and uh, uh, where OpenStack fits? So, uh, the business is very technically led. It's growing very aggressively and has done since its inception. Um, so, what led us to cloud really was something that would give us that scale, that ability to react to the demand that we are are creating by growing that business and growing that product. Um, coming to OpenStack was a bit of a wider question, I guess. So we were looking around to replace and bring up to date a lot of our infrastructure. It had served us pretty well up to a certain point, but as things kept growing, we needed to be able to put, some, put the next generation in. So we looked around for how we would do that. Um, we're a regulated business, so we couldn't just go out to an AWS or somewhere public, and we had to be able to actually kind of point to the systems and to the, to the boxes ourselves. Um, long story short, we ended up looking at an OpenStack solution, so KVM, uh, OpenStack on top, and a whole host of orchestration and tooling on top of that, which would give us the ability to, um, uh, to, to have that production workload and continue to run that at the scale that it needed to, but also give us a chance to increase and improve our automation and our tooling um, into the next generation to speed up all of, the, uh, all of the code through to production that we were trying to do. Yeah, give, give us a sense. Uh, obviously, um, you know, rules, laws are different here in the states versus yeah. where they are. Um, but give us a sense of, you know, what, what, what's the scope of what people can, uh, you know, make bets on? Is it, is it just sports? Is it all aspects of what's going? You know, presidential elections and so forth. And, yep. and then, how have things like, you know, mobile, uh, you know, sort of impacted that, where people can get information online, interact with the site online? You know, help us understand the scale and scope a little bit. Yeah, sure, so the business is primarily sports betting, yeah. um, although there are some special markets that will allow you to, you know, bet on some of the weather or who's going to be the next president election or who's going to win uh, some TV show. There's a few yeah. of those as well, but it's predominantly sports, um, and the, most of the business is predominantly in, in UK and Ireland and around Europe. Um, it's been quite important for us to go for regulated um, areas so that we can uh, make sure that the, the experience that we put in place is right and proper. Um, so there are some places like the States where there are places that you can't gamble on our site. Right. Um, the, the, um, uh, the sporting industry is quite interesting. We get some sort of periods where we have great big events. Um, we have an annual event in Europe called the Grand National which is, I guess it's a bit like the Kentucky Derby, it's yeah. the biggest horse race around. So actually trying to put in place a system that can scale to meet those kind of demands has its own challenges as well, right. especially when you can't take a public cloud and just burst up and burst down your capacity for that one day. So these things, all that, that kind of sporting side of it, plus the occasional big events as well, it's quite an interesting challenge. Yeah, you sort of get this lumpiness of how do you deal with that, yeah. For sure, well, one good thing is because it's a sporting event, you can see it coming from a long sure. way away, so we can plot this on a calendar. Um, 
to deal with it. It's quite interesting. You spend a lot of time testing at that scale to make sure that you can cope with that kind of demand. Um, and there are lessons that you learn from each event that you'll then roll into the next one as well. Yeah. So, Rich, you talk a little, if you can, uh, explain a little bit the OpenStack environment. You know, what projects you're using, yep. you know, what, what partners you use to put the thing together. And, and one of the things we've been looking at is, uh, unlike some technologies where it was like, oh, well, let's stick it in a little corner and test it and do something, you know, that, that might not be important. Uh, we've been saying you should do something that's important to the business, has to be something bigger so that, you know, it can succeed. Uh, so, you know, as that is set up, uh, you know, please, please share a little bit about it. So the products we're using, um, we've got KVM virtualization at the bottom, we have Red Hat's OpenStack platform on top of that. We have a whole host of tooling that a lot of it we put together ourselves from various open source projects um, to give us that delivery side as well. We've partnered with, not only with Red Hat but with Nuage Networks and Nuage brought with them the software-defined networking, which was quite a, quite a pivotal part of the project but quite an interesting decision at the start of the project. It was something we hadn't done before, it was quite new for us. And in fact, we, we talked to a lot of different analysts and looked at a, a lot of research to try and work out whether we should take advantage of this software-defined networking when we started the project. It's about a year ago from now. Um, and as many came back and said, you definitely should, as came back who said, you definitely shouldn't. So we spent a lot of time talking to Red Hat about how could we use this, how could we make sure we were picking the right partner. Um, and between ourselves and Red Hat, um, we chose and partnered up with Nuage as well. And in fact, it's worked remarkably well. The software-defined networking gives me the um, the ability to deploy and to mutate the network at a pace that suits the developers, but also gives us a performance boost as well over traditional networking where perhaps we had to hop out of the network to a firewall or some security device and back in again. Now we have these distributed firewalls that sit around the hypervisors and give us the performance improvement as well. Yeah. Inside the OpenStack st uh, stack itself, do you know how many projects you're using? Gosh, no, I don't. I, <laughs> I would have to get one of our technical guys to list them all out. Yeah. <laughs> You, you talked a little bit about you know you're regulated within a regulated industry, which people tend to think okay it's regulated, it's going to move fairly slow, and, and people are able to you know do manual tasks in IT. But at the same time, you're you, you know you've got software development, you've got continuous yep. integration. Like talk a little bit about how that fast moving software development aligns to also having to do compliance and you know maintain the network and how yep. do you find that right balance? Um, yeah, I guess it's a tricky balance, and when I look around at other players in similar industries, it's certainly something they struggle with, how they can, how they can give the right level of compliance in a, in a way that people are happy with. For, for me, it all comes back to being able to automate it. Um, yeah. I've got the saying I'm trying to coin at the moment, which is dot, dot, dot as code. I'm trying to do everything as code, trying to encode everything. So whether it's deploying our application, whether it's deploying a part of the infrastructure, or whether it's embedding some of the governance, some of the checks and audits that we need to do, if I can, I try and encode those, we try and put them into pipelines, we try and make it so that instead of testing once in a while, why, why not test every time? If we can encode it, if we can put it into a pipeline and test every time software goes through that pipeline, why would we not do that? And, and the compliance side, the auditing side likes that as well because what you're left with is a fantastic log of activity that is absolute and complete. That it's yeah. not a, a point in time check. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a great point. You know, for a long time people thought, well, the clouds are in less secure. I don't know how I'm going to do auditing and compliance. And, it, and at the end of the day you say, well, if I have records of everything we did and they're done repeatedly the same way every single time, yep. that's an auditor's dream because they know where the information is and they know what the, the, the process and tasks was. So. And not just repeatedly, but reproducibly. So it doesn't matter who's doing it, it's still yeah, that right. same output every right. time. So you can come here for a few days and the staff will keep working and it doesn't, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So that's been, that's been very helpful. We put a bit of time into looking at, at ways that we can internally as well for our own audits, so that we can embed things like security hardening, um, checks, uh, whether they're lesson learned type checks or whether they're hardening types check for patching, <coughs> and how we can encode that and make sure that that goes through its own delivery pipelines. Yeah. So we want to get to a point where every time a developer spins up an EVM, the base image of that OS is something that is already hardened, already patched, is already up to date, and that's happening behind the scenes for them. They just take the latest um, gold starred OS build that's ready to go and take that through, and we're happy that that has been through all of those processes and is hardened and is safe and secure. Right. So, Rich, you know, for peers of yours that might be saying, you know, hey, this sounds kind of interesting, uh, you know, I'm looking at OpenStack, can you give a little guidance as to, uh, you know, a few things, time frame, you know, how long you spent kind of planning it, how long the rollout went, uh, did that meet expectations, sure. you know, budget, uh, and uh, the other thing, kind of the operations, your people, you know, what kind of training, reskilling, moving people around, uh, kind of, I know it's a big question, but. Yeah, kind sure, of yeah, and I won't lie, it's, it's, it's been a big project. In terms of time frames, um, one of, one of Betfair's values was pace, and it's something that we, we've lived up to for this project. So I think it was probably around a year ago we started talking about 
um, should we be looking at an open site project? Could we do this? Could we get it to scale and work? Um, could we get some of these advantages from it? Um, after engaging the vendors, after choosing the partners that we went to work with, we went into a proof of concept, and that was a, we time boxed that to four weeks. And in four weeks, we wanted to create um, a very base open stack set up based on the hardware that we chose and based on the software stack we were putting together and just run a, a small set of functional and performance tests against that to make sure that the output of the RFP, we could, we could see it for real. Um, and, and that was fun doing that in four weeks. A lot of the vendors we were working with, kind of eyes went wide when we said, hey, you know, we want to try and do this in a month. But, but we achieved it and it also got the partnership working as well, getting the people working that pace. We, put, we brought in uh, some of the guys on site with us, they sat with us, they co-located. Um, and in four weeks' time, we had proven that we could do this and it looked fine, and that kind of unlocked the budget and the steps to then go to the, the next phase. That's our pilot phase, which was growing the seeds of what would become the production infrastructure. This is now in two data centers. It's um, fit for purpose in terms of all the tooling, all of the monitoring and everything else that sits on top of this. And we were aiming for around six months to go from zero to ready for production. Um, with um, 100, 150 hypervisor type nodes making that. So that itself was quite aggressive. Um, our pilot would end up being bigger than a lot of our reference sites, entire production sites were. Um, but we had the confidence from the initial proof of concept that we, we could do it and we knew what we were going to do to get there. So we're just at the end of that pilot phase now. Um, we've just put some workload live. We're just starting to now ramp that up. And we're into our, the third project, which is our, my migration project, which is probably the longest of those and it's probably going to stretch around 18 months. And we will, we will now have to take around 200 different applications and move them across from our old legacy estate into the new estate. And it's not just the lift and shift, because as part of moving them across, some of them will have some architectural changes to make to either run active-active or to be able to be deployed immutably rather than just continuously deploying on top of an existing box. But we're also using this as a chance for all of them to adopt the delivery tooling to make best use of the, uh, the pipelining, the monitoring, um, and all of the sort of the checks and tests that we're doing as part of that. So not only is it a migration project, but it's also a very nice kind of cleanup of the estate, getting us into a very fit state going forwards. And then the, the fourth project, which, which will be a decommissioning project, will then help us take down and take away all of that old estate, uh, one, to get rid of it, but also free up some room in our data centers for the new estate as it grows out. Yeah. So it's. It's a fairly long period of time, but we're, it's, we've been going at it with some pace. Okay, um, so on pricing, it's open source, so everything is free, right? Ah, for sure, yeah. Yeah, no, <laughs> it didn't work like that. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not going to go into too much about the budgets, yeah. of course, but um, for us, the real benefits were around trying to provide the pace of delivery for our development teams and providing a reliable infrastructure for the business, and those were really the key things that we were looking yeah. at. I, I guess the, the thing I want to poke out without going into too much detail is did the, where you are right now, uh, were there overruns? Is it uh, you know priced about where you expected? Any surprises that people should look out for? Yep. So no no financial surprises at the moment. Um, in fact, if anything, we had a nice surprise. The the distributed uh, firewalling inside Nuage meant that I had some risk budget put aside for some some fairly fat firewall devices to sit on the outside. Um, that actually we've we've realised we don't actually need. In fact, the the security model inside Nuage is is good enough for what we want. So. Pricing-wise, it's been one of the nicer projects. In, in, in completing this arc, talk about the impact on kind of personnel, operations, skill sets. Yeah, that's an interesting one because um, it's one thing landing the technology, but trying to land the cultural change is much more complicated. Um, now we're we're quite ahead, I think, at Paddy Power Betfair. We're quite a mature company in terms of the, the DevOps approach, but in terms of developers owning their own products from inception right the way through to production and, and to eventually being decommissioned, where we do quite a good job. What we've done is we've taken that model and we're putting it into the world of infrastructure as well. So this comes back to the dot, dot, dot as code. Um, our network engineers, our storage guys, the guys that keep the lights on on the, on the physical estates, um, they are now also starting to be able to um, make use of the tooling and, um, and that kind of DevOps approach whereby we, we start to treat these things no differently than any other software application we might have, and those teams get as much say and as much uh, ability to, to change and kind of plan what they're doing as the development teams would do. Yeah. So yeah, there are some changes. Um, I think it's for the better. Um, hopefully, just like in the software world, people will stop doing the monotonous tasks over and over. We can encode those, we can give them tools to do that, and they can spend their time doing the much more interesting work. Yeah. You, you, you gave a great example. You sort of went from a pilot, you wanted to sort of force yourselves and, and, uh, and Red Hat to work a certain way. You reached a milestone where you said the budgets got unleashed to, to go bigger. Yep. You're still in the process of building some of this out, operating and building. Have you figured out sort of a new set of language or a new set of metrics to, to talk to the business and say, this is, this is what it's doing for us? Or, or you know, are there things yet that they go, oh, th this is 
bigger, better, faster, whatever met what they were looking for? So probably the most impactful are where we are looking at you know, the time from checking in a piece of code to it landing on a production estate. And that in the previous estate really varied, and it varied on the tool chains that those teams were using, whether they needed specific exotic hardware, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what we've been able to get to now is a place where um, to get yourself a new machine, to roll your code to it, and to put it through a series of testing, if you, if you exclude let's say that the crux of the test packs, which could be, I guess, a variable size, um, we're down to minutes to be able to do that. And previously that was perhaps days or even in some occasions weeks. So the, what I'm hoping the, the biggest impact we'll find on the business will be that developers will be, be able to much more quickly take their code from check-in through to production and be able to do that repeatedly without having to raise tickets or wait in line or go and have to talk to someone to try and understand their requirements. Yeah, so you could literally now sort of connect the dots between business idea and execution in measurable, measurable ways now. Yeah, and what I'm hoping we'll do is we will start to track these. Um, Paddy Pavet is quite good at measuring everything we can. Yeah. So whether it's, whether it's, I don't know, CPU spikes or, or whether it's um, some of the process we're doing, we will try and look at the data and, and, just, and drive our decisions based on that. So what I'm hoping we'll do is we'll start to be able to track these delivery times, the testing times, and, and that will become a set of metrics that we can then use to try and make these processes even more efficient. Whether that's changing tooling or changing the way we use the tooling or run stuff in parallel, we'll have all of these options yeah. open. So Rich, you know, how would you characterize you know, the kind of the maturity, uh, you know, performance, scalability of, of the OpenStack environments today? So from what we've seen so far, it looks pretty good. Um, we are at the start of our migrating things into production and I'm sure there are challenges to come. Some of the infrastructure that we run is, is very uh, highly performant, uh, thousands of transactions per seconds per node. So we have to make sure that we put in place something that can cope with that. But we, we're looking forward to things like the Ironic project where we should be able to provide a bare metal provisioning using that same tool chain and all that same processes, <coughs> but give us a, a bare metal box that can cope for some of those more exotic requirements. And then that and then opens itself up to uh, perhaps containerized solutions in the future as well that can sit on top of that. So I'm happy that we've got something that's fit for purpose now, but I'm also happy the roadmap going forwards uh, seems to be going in the right place and, and it will provide us with the capabilities we need. Yeah. I I have a term I use sometimes called data feedback loops. I mean, you're, you're now reaching a point where you can move software faster, uh, you're going to get feedback from, from the site reliability team on things you're working. Can you talk at all about how you use data to help you make decisions and who it gets shared with? Is it you know, yep. just within your team? Does it share up to the business? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, one of the things I'm uh, particularly keen on is transparency and data. So when we are uh, me measuring things or looking at things inside the business, we try and share it with anyone who, who would like it. Yeah. Um, sometimes uh, people will think of a use for it that we hadn't thought of, so they should have it, it should be open right. for them. In terms of actual metrics, I'll give you a good example. We run a time series monitoring system called OpenTSDB, it's another open source project, um, and this looks at all of the time series data across our production estate. Um, and to put it into scale, we consume something like 100, 120,000 transaction points per second every second of the day, every day of the year. And we have absolute granularity of that per second all the way back for about four and a half years now from when that project started. Now that, that wealth of data is fantastic, not, totally in how, not only in how the system's running now, but forensically, for if I want to look at something that blipped or I want to look at a, at a key sporting event last year to see what the scaling factors were so they can forward apply them to this year. So it really is very, very data driven all the way down to that kind of per second stuff and we use it daily and it's shared across as many teams as we can get it to. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. And, and that's really interesting because now you're going to have a common language you can talk about, right? Consistent things you can look at and what's relevant to your team might be different than what's relevant to your sales and marketing team around an event or something like that. So Absolutely. Interesting. Yeah. interesting. So, Rich, with the uh, with hindsight now, I know you're not completely done. Uh, you know, with, with, with the full rollout here, um, what advice would you give you to your peers? What, you know, what would you say? You know, I would change a little bit different, or you know, move a little faster, or uh, you know, wish I had done this. Uh, you know, uh, involve these people. Uh, you know, what did you learn uh, that you might do a little bit differently? That's a good question. Um, I'm fairly happy with what we've done so far. With some advice for my peers. I think you can't underestimate the, the importance of the people side of a project like this. And that's not just the people inside your organization, but it's also the, the people that are partnering with you and your suppliers. Um, one thing that we've tried very much to do is once we've chosen these partners with Red Hat and Nuage, is that we wanted to treat them as if they were our own. So we've tried to reduce that kind of vendor client barrier as much as we can. And a really good example of that is some of the times where we've maybe had a technical issue and we've all been sat around trying to work out what happened, why did it happen. 
Paddy Pelbetfer does a very good post-incident review, a blameless post-mortem, where everyone very openly speaks around what they think happened. Um, there's no finger pointing, it's no one's fault. We always use it as a way to try and learn and to help us going forwards. And what's been quite interesting is bringing the vendors along for that ride, getting the partners involved in this as well, and watching their teams go from a very, um, a very consultant client approach at the start to actually now rolling up the sleeves and getting involved in this and being part of this kind of blameless boat model and stuff. Right. But I think that kind of goes down into the bigger question of if you can, if you're thinking of embarking on this journey and you're thinking of picking some partners to help you do it, try and involve them as soon as you can and, and involve them completely. Bring them into your business, um, have them spend time with your people and, and really treat them like they're part of your business. Yeah. All right, so Rich, this is your first time coming to the OpenStack show. What's yep. your experience been? You know, I don't know if you've been to Austin before, but love to hear kind of you know, the show, your peers, the city. Yeah, it's uh, my first time to Austin. It's my first time to the OpenStack Summit. Uh, it's big, is my reaction. Everything's bigger in Texas. Wow, yeah. No, I was amazed at the scale of this place, actually. Yeah, Betfair has some scale, but this is, this is big. Um, it's been really great. So the, the different tracks, the sessions, the keynotes, um, it's been fantastic walking around and being able to cherry pick between various things that you're interested in. But it's not just the sessions that are going on that you can attend. It's the guys in the booths. It's the other clients, the other people that are using OpenStack, and to spend some time with them and, and share their stories and their discussions around what they done and the problems they've had, but also what they're looking forward to in the next few releases. That, that's been fantastic. Yeah. That's great. Uh, you know, sort of last word in terms of where you see you know, this going. I mean, um, do you guys expect to sort of actively you know, try and participate as part of OpenStack? Do you feel like, look, uh, you know, in working with Red Hat, they sort of act as your proxy on behalf of you? What, what, how do you feel like it's the right interaction between you and the, and the community, whether it's in terms of just working in the open space or maybe eventually writing code? Yeah, um, so we, we would like to get very involved. Um, Paddy Power Vet Fair has a very good history of being involved in open uh, source communities and I don't see this as, as being any different. Um, yes, we want to commit stuff back. In fact, I think we've recently just put around 40, 45 Ansible modules for some of the new Arch networking stuff mm -hmm. and push that back out to the community. So we'll continue to work providing answers to problems that we see or, or issues that we found um, and sharing those with the community. That's all part of the, of the process of taking something open source. Um, but it's also, I'm quite happy that we can talk about what we're doing, that we're happy <laughs> to be here at places like theCUBE talking around our experiences in this process um, so that the rest of the community can, can learn from us but also maybe listen and think, hey, okay, I'm, I'm doing something similar to that guy. Uh, I've got something that might be able to help. Let me go and have a chat with him. Right. So on, on all of those things, I'm very happy that we are part of this bigger community and I look forward to being an active contributor going forward. That's great. I, I know we get to a lot of meetups, we get to a lot of events. I mean, we could have played buzzword bingo. We were talking about DevOps and infrastructure sure. as code. It's great to see it implemented, we're, it, you know, see it in production, see it at the non-unicorn Silicon Valley. You know, everyone sort of worries, is that just within Silicon Valley? It's great to see what you guys are doing you know, in the rest of the world, uh, taking advantage of you know, this interaction between your business, vendors, the open community. You know, you know, it's, it's great to see it in practice. Yeah, it's great to be a part of it. Yep. All right, well, Rich, really appreciate you taking the time. One of the super users here at the OpenStack show. We'll be right back with more coverage here of OpenStack 2016. You're watching theCUBE.